The disparity in the sorts of bombers used by the opposing forces in the Second World War is a subject that is quite often discussed in military history circles. Whilst the Americans and British deployed vast numbers of heavy bombers, the German Luftwaffe was constrained almost entirely to light and medium types, which had a focus on tactical and operational support rather than strategic bombing. This is recognised as a fundamental difference in air power philosophies between the protagonists. Though the effectiveness of the Allied bombing campaign is still a subject of debate today, the Germans, as the target for the massive fleets of bombers, certainly did not appreciate the destruction wrought and made strenuous efforts to counter them. It also led to some attempts by Nazi Germany to develop their own heavy bombers as the war raged. This though, with their industry fully committed already to their current war production plans, was largely for naught, and very little in terms of German heavy bombers would be produced. And so the history of the Second World War is marked by these very different respective takes on the employment of air power. But it almost didn't happen that way, because at one stage it seemed highly likely that Nazi Germany would devote itself to the concept of the four-engine heavy bomber, and may well have been able to lead the field in this regard by the time war broke out in 1939. But for one incident. This is the story of one man's vision, and one of the aircraft that sprang from it. The man was General Walter Weber, the first chief of staff of the Luftwaffe. The aircraft is the Junkers Ju-89. When the Luftwaffe was officially created in 1935, this aircraft had in fact been in the process of development for a year, and the key person in this development was Verva, a lifetime professional soldier. Verva had served in the field and as a staff officer with the German Army High Command during the First World War, then stayed in the Reichswehr afterwards. With the rise to power of Hitler and the massive expansion of the Luftwaffe, Verva was promoted to be effectively the strategist of how the new air force was going to be employed and, as a result, what sort of aircraft it was going to be equipped with. In this, he had two main influences. Firstly, Verva understood that the message that Hitler was expounding in Mein Kampf was that the Soviet Union was the paramount foe for Germany. And secondly, with an extensive background in military high command, he appreciated the necessity of strategy encompassing not just the tactical and operational facets of combat, but also the need to consider political and strategic objectives in planning. As a result, he was deeply interested in the possibilities offered by the long-range strategic bomber and in the air power theories of Doe. What Verva believed would be needed by the Luftwaffe for fighting in the future war was the heavy bomber. This needed to be able to strike at Soviet industry hidden deep inside that country, possibly beyond the Ural Mountains. In 1934, Verva held secret discussions with two of Germany's foremost heavy aircraft builders at the time, Dornier and Junkers, where the groundwork for building a bomber capable of this role, the so-called Ural Bomber, was laid. In 1935, Verva had both companies issued contracts to build prototypes of their proposals. At this point, let's have a look at what other countries were doing at this time. The British in 1934 were just bringing their latest heavy bomber into service, the Handley Page Hayford, and were developing their next, the Ferry Hendon. It wouldn't be until 1936 that the British issued a specification for a four-engine heavy bomber, which would eventually become the Short Sterling. This wouldn't fly until 1938 as a prototype. The United States were slightly ahead in their thinking, as in 1934 they were issuing the specification for a new multi-engine bomber which would go on to become the Boeing B-17 Flying Fortress. The prototype for this, the Model 299, would actually fly in late 1935. These projects were the basis of the huge bomber fleets both countries would use during the war. Germany was therefore effectively running a heavy bomber development program at the same time as its two future enemies, and arguably with the Ju-89, had a potentially better aircraft. Projected armament was a single 8mm machine gun in both nose and tail positions, with single 20mm cannon also mounted in dorsal and ventral turrets. Bomb load was expected to be 1,600 kilograms, around 3,500 pounds, which may seem small for a heavy bomber, but was broadly on par with designs at the time. The Boeing 299 could carry 2,180 kilograms, 4,800 pounds, 
but its defensive armament of five 30 calibre machine guns, which was considered exceptionally heavy for the day and led to the Flying Fortress nickname, was far inferior to the JU-89s. Additionally, the Boeing had far less engine power. When the 299 first flew in July 1935, it used Pratt & Whitney Hornet radials that produced 750 horsepower each. When the JU-89 V1 first flew in December 1936, it was equipped with four UMO 211A engines, which produced around 1,000 horsepower each. Shortly after this, the V2 flew, which had four Daimler-Benz 600 engines that produced 960 horsepower. These liquid-cooled V12s would see great development in the ensuing years, the UMO 211 being built in huge numbers until the end of the war, the DB series engines gradually improving into later models of much greater power. As it was, the prototype's performance was certainly on par with contemporary aircraft of other nations. In testing, the V2 recorded a top speed of 242 miles per hour, that's around 390 kilometers per hour. This compares with the Boeing 299's top speed of 252 miles per hour, 406 kilometers per hour. Additionally, though the JU-89 had been designed with a rather limited bomb load in mind, the machine showed a great ability to carry considerably heavier weights. In June 1938, the JU-89 set two new payload to altitude world records, first by flying with a cargo of 5,000 kilograms, 11,000 pounds, at an altitude of 9,312 meters, 30,551 feet, then four days later carrying 10,000 kilograms, 22,000 pounds, to 7,242 meters, 23,760 feet. Though this is obviously in testing, it does demonstrate that the JU-89 did have the potential to substantially improve on its bomb load as the type developed, especially if more powerful engines had been fitted, as would inevitably have happened had the aircraft got into service. So what happened? Basically, change of management. In June 1936, Verva was killed in an air crash, before either of the prospective Ural bombers even flew, and his death effectively killed the plans for a German heavy bomber. Verva's replacement as Chief of Staff of the Luftwaffe was Albert Kessering, who believed the direction that the Luftwaffe should take was with emphasis in supporting the field army. He was backed up in this by Ernst Dudet, then head of the Air Force Technical Office, who was vehement on dive bombing and the importance of using aircraft for tactical purposes. His influence would go on to have some interesting effects on German aircraft designs, but those are for our other videos. Between them, they were easily able to convince Goering of the change in direction that they wanted to make, dropping any notions of heavy bombers and concentrating on lighter single and twin engine aircraft. As Goering was under pressure from Hitler to build up the new air force quickly, he was more than happy to authorise the change in doctrine, reportedly saying that the Führer does not ask me how big our bombers are, but how many we have. As a result, he ordered the end of the Ural bomber project on the 29th of April 1937, and that efforts were to be concentrated on smaller, more economical types. Certainly the building of large numbers of heavy bombers would have been an additional burden on the German war economy, and a major diversion from smaller, more numerous aircraft that otherwise were built. But one must wonder what differences a large number of JU-89s may have made on, for example, the bombing campaign on Britain. By 1940, this aircraft would likely have been flying with engines producing 1,200 horsepower and likely carrying far heavier bomb loads and defensive firepower. Would it have made a difference? Well, that is a subject for speculation. What we do know is that the JU-89 did leave some legacy. Though they may not have wanted a heavy bomber anymore, Junkers did think the aircraft might make an excellent basis for a passenger aircraft. As a result, one of the JU-89 prototypes was converted to be the first JU-90, and a total of 18 of these would be built for service with Lufthansa. And these in turn would go on to form the basis for the JU-290, a long-range reconnaissance aircraft and bomber. So the effort put into the JU-89 wasn't totally wasted, but it will always remain an aircraft that will inspire debates about what may have been.